Okay, hello, good afternoon, everyone uh, watching this live stream. We had some uh, technical problems, but we seem to be live right now. And here with me uh, are um, Matthias de Smet and uh, Capacha, Tom Lesher Capacha, better known as Capacha. Uh, so uh, I am uh, Misha Verheid of Restory, uh, together with Alke, who is behind the Restory logo and who does the technical support and had to, has to do the most work uh, till now. Um, uh, and Geert Grande, I founded Restory. Uh, Restory is a journalistic platform. Uh, I will keep it uh, short. Uh, it's a community because we believe um, we need each other. And I think if the conversation with uh, Matthias and Apacha this afternoon will show one thing, it will be that we need each other very much. Um, next to that, Restory is helping uh, companies and organizations to bring their stories about um, uh, change and sustainability. So uh, over to the main characters of this afternoon. Uh, we have um, Matthias de Smet, who is a professor clinical uh, psychology at uh, Ghent University and uh, wrote uh, different books. And the one uh, which will be central this afternoon is the uh, psychology of totalitarianism. And uh, on the other hand, we have uh, Tom Lesher Capaccia, um, who is an astrologer, an evolutionary astrologer, and who is doing weekly uh, um, Pele reports in which he uh, talks about uh, the planets and uh, how they react, uh, how they affect um, our daily life on planet Earth. Um, so um, uh, my first question would be to, uh, to introduce uh, you both and uh, please keep it short so we win some time because Matthias need, uh, needs to end this interview at 5.30. Uh, Matthias, to you, uh, I would like to ask uh, to tell us more about how you uh, got into this topic of uh, totalitarianism. How, how did it get your interest? Hmm. That's a good question. Um, you know, I started to think about it in 2017 when I noticed that in one way or another, um, there were certain evolutions that reminded me of, um, of the emergence of a totalitarian state, uh, and this time not a fascist or a communist totalitarian state, but, but this kind of totalitarianism for which Hannah Arendt warned us already in 1951, uh, namely a technocratic totalitarianism, a totalitarianism which is led not by gang leaders such as Stalin and Hitler, but by dull bureaucrats and technocrats, as she, as she explained in 1951. Um, and I was interested at that moment in a totalitarianism uh, because I, I had been confronted with the phenomenon of mass formation uh, during my, my work uh, at university. I started to work at university in 2003, and I won't make it too long, but I will, I will explain this in a nutshell. I started to work at university in 2003, and I was supposed to, to do a classical psychological research, but I immediately noticed that the research methods actually were very flawed, or at least that the results of academic research in psychology uh, were highly questionable. And um, so I asked my promoter permission to investigate the research methods instead of just doing a classical psychological research. And uh, Happily for me, uh, after two years, the so-called replication crisis started in psychology. The replication crisis, which showed that in academic, uh, in, a, in academic research in general, the replication crisis, crisis which showed that up to 85% of the uh, published academic research uh, is flawed and actually uh, uh, cannot be reproduced. So, which means uh, that it is uh, almost useless. And in the medical field, the field of the medical sciences, the problem was worse, even, uh, even 
even worse than in psychology. So, um, and at that moment, I wrote my first book in which I showed in a very concrete and a very tangible uh, way um, why most research methods in academic research actually can't lead to valid results. And to my surprise, I noticed that most of my colleagues uh, became angry at me. They refused mm -hmm. to open their eyes. 10% uh, did, maybe about 10%. Uh, the rest became angry at me, even when confronted with the most clear-cut evidence that the kind of research they did uh, was in, in, in many respects absurd. And that was the moment when I started to think, uh, like, what possibly could explain that human beings become so incredibly blind for even the most straightforward evidence showing that what they believe in is absurd. And um, that's how I ended up with mass psychology. I had a feeling that individual psychology was not capable of explaining this blindness, but mass psychology was. And when the Corona crisis started, I went through the same process, but in a very short period of time. I noticed immediately from the first minutes on uh, that the, the statistics, statistics were absurd. Uh, and actually, there is one thing important. Two months before the corona crisis, I had this intuition that something would happen in our society. And I told my friends, we will wake up one of these days in a new society. So I went to the bank, paid back by, by mortgage. And just because I wanted to be as sovereign and independent as possible. And two months later, the corona crisis started. And maybe it was a happy coincidence. You can never be sure. And I said to my friends, look, this was what I was talking about. And um, uh, so immediately, I was immediately like taking a critical distance from what happened. I have a master in statistics besides my master in psychology. So I studied the statistics. I noticed immediately that the statistics dramatically overrated the dangerousness of the virus. Um, I tried to show it to some of my colleagues. I noticed immediately that they refused to see what was happening and that they refused to see the absurdity of most statistics. And I decided uh, in a very early stage that I would focus on the psychological mechanisms that were at work in the crisis and that I would speak out. So that was my personal decision. I don't know why I made it, but from the first minutes of the crisis, I knew I will speak out. And I will continue to speak out. And I, that's, uh, I'm very happy that I made that choice. I lost some, some things here and there, some credibility in the academic world and some, uh, well, some possibilities here and there. But uh, I, the longer I speak out, the more I know that it uh, also, that I win. And the only thing that is really important to a human being, and that is, I think, that, um, uh, it has the courage to stick to the ethical principles of humanity. And the first of these principles for me is that you have the ethical duty to articulate the words that emerge in yourself and that you think uh, are honest and sincere words. What doesn't mean that you have to think that you are the only one who knows the truth or something, but just if to your best, to the best of your uh, understanding, uh, you think that something is wrong and another thing is right, then you have to try to articulate your opinion, I think. Uh, that's an ethical duty towards your fellow human beings, I think. So I totally that's my agree. short introduction. Yeah, I totally agree with you, uh, Matthias. That's also a reason to do this uh, interview. So uh, over to you, Kapacha. Can you tell us more about how you uh, came, uh, how evolutionary astrology came into your life? Well, I uh, moved to uh, live next door to an astrologer and uh, never believed in uh, astrology. I didn't even know my sun sign or anything like that. And uh, I just went uh, and I didn't know him. And I went over to uh, his house one day and he uh, pulled out my chart, calculated my chart and told me about my, uh, my, my past lives and my girlfriend and my parents and my broken knee and my crashed motorcycle and <laughs> knew me better than anybody else knew me uh, who had never seen me before. And it kind of blew my mind. So I, uh, I, I gathered all the books I could and uh, did all the charts of my family and friends and uh, dove into it. Uh, that was in the 70s. So I've been exploring uh, the correlations as above, so below. Uh, as without, so within. I've been looking more in the esoteric realm. So when I heard Matthias uh, uh, speak on, on YouTube, 
uh, a couple of different uh, times there, uh, one with uh, Del Big Tree and uh, speaking of the mass formation. And I'm, I'm, I've been working with the collective unconscious. I think uh, Carl Jung uh, said basically that uh, astrology is the mother of psychology. And I've always felt uh, in my counseling, I do readings for people and I help people to find meaning in their life. <laughs> I help people to uh, uh, find meaning in their relationships. I help people to find a sense of uh, connection to something greater than themselves uh, every day. And this is, uh, this is what I do with mysticism, with uh, Kundalini yoga and with astrology. So I work with the occult sciences. I work with what is hidden, uh, with what is esoteric, uh, and is uh, somewhat mirrored in quantum physics. So we can, uh, I thought that today we might uh, begin with, uh, you know, Matthias's last chapter. I, I uh, unfortunately have not had time uh, to uh, read uh, the book, um, but I understand from your, uh, from your interview that uh, towards the end, uh, where you speak of the non-rational the, and the need for a new approach, uh, to me, uh, yeah, there's a lot, there's a lot of things that, uh, astrology can add, uh, to the picture that, uh, you know, that can even, uh, expand and even clarify and even deepen in terms of timing. Uh, we can look at, uh, all of evolution occurs according to cycles and we are in very big cycles of time that, uh, not only the planets, but, uh, uh the mystics have uh, spoken of so we can really kind of uh, get a, a bigger wider broader uh, understanding from kind of a helicopter uh, viewpoint of uh, the ufo <laughs> uh, viewpoint of what's going on down here on planet earth uh, over uh, the course of history i know that uh, matthias has looked into you know uh, 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 the different uh, forms of totalitarianism in the recent history but, uh, you know, going back thousands of years, as we can um, with astrology, we can really kind of look at uh, uh, much larger uh, cycles of unfoldment and evolution uh, for humanity, at, uh, um, you know, and, and the collective. So I thought that, um, yeah, that we would have a great conversation today. I think we're on the same page. We see the same things from, uh, from a different uh, perspective. And, uh, and we can really uh, 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 come together here and offer people, uh, you know, some, uh, you know, ways of dealing with uh, uh, what I consider the madness that uh, we find ourselves in these days. Yeah, that's great, uh, Kapacha. You, you stole my words because that's uh, what I wanted to say. I think you both tell the same story from a different perspective. And uh, it's... Uh, very interesting to to bring the stories together so uh, i would like to dive deeper into that in a minute but first um I, the motivation for this interview to bring you two together was the paler report by capacha of june 1st in which he talked about uh, an interview uh, with you Mat uh, matthias at um, tea time and um you explained there uh, the, the mass formation and um, uh, the process behind it. And could you tell us more about, about this? Uh, what do you mean with mass formation? And um, what is the process you see behind it and where we are heading now? Well, I, will summarize it, I will summarize it in a nutshell. So mass formation is a specific kind of group formation, which has a specific effect at individual psychological functioning. For instance, it makes people uh, incapable of taking a critical distance of what the group believes in. So it's a kind of group thing, you could say. Uh, it uh, makes people willing to self-sacrifice to a, a very high extent. So it is as if people are no longer aware of their own egoistic interests or their, of their own individual interests. Uh, mass formation always leads to an extreme collectivism. So it's the, the balance between individualism and collectivism uh, is disturbed. Uh, it's an extreme, uh, mass formation always leads to an extreme collectivism in which the indiv individual disappears in the group. Um, that's one characteristic, and there are many others. So, and then mass formation all, also leads, makes an individual radically intolerant for dissonant voices to the extent that is mass, if mass formation continues for a long time, 
it typically uh, uh, makes individuals convinced that it is their ethical duty to destroy the people who do not go along with them, even if it concerns people they used to love uh, very much before the mass formation started. For instance, in Iran, there was this mother, uh, a woman of Iran, described me this case. Uh, she described uh, the name of, the, of, of this woman was Sharif Eshtali. Uh, she described how she had seen with her own eyes as, how someone, a mother, reported her son to the state and hung the rope around the neck of her son on the, on the, on, on the scaffold. Uh, and when he was hung, she claimed to be a heroine for what she did. So that's typically the end stage of mass formation. When does this happen? It happens if a population is in a very specific state, uh, if many people feel disconnected from their natural and social environment, if many people struggle with profound lack of meaning making in life, if they think their life is purposeless, if they think their life is purposeless, and then uh, if they are confronted with uh, a lot of free floating anxiety, frustration, and aggression, that means that the negative effects are not connected anymore to a mental representation that people feel anxious, scared, frustrated, aggressive, without knowing what they feel anxious, scared, frustrated, and aggressive for. Um, so when these, all these different characteristics are connected to each other, if someone feels disconnected from his environment, he will typically struggle with lack of meaning making, and he will typically be confronted with um, frustration, anxiety, aggression, and so on. That's what I, I describe this in much more detail in my book. So, but, and then if under these conditions, like a narrative, is distributed, preferably through mass media, that puts forward or that indicates an object of anxiety and that provides, provides a strategy to deal with the object of anxiety. For instance, the lockdowns to deal with the virus or the concentration camps to deal with the Jews or the witch hunts to deal with the witches that are all historical examples of mass formation. If such a narrative is disseminated through the mass media, all this freely floating anxiety connects to the object of anxiety and there is a huge willingness to participate in a strategy to destroy the object of anxiety, no matter how absurd the strategy is. And this in itself, because many people at the same time participate in this strategy, a new kind of meaning making emerges. People feel connected again. They fight a collective heroic battle with the object of anxiety. Um, and so uh, it is as if people uh, got to it through the mass formation of all their previous problems, the isolation, the, the disconnectedness, the meaninglessness, the free-floating anxiety, frustration, and aggression. But, and that's important, um, that's an illusion because mass formation, it seems as if mass conation creates a new social bond, but this new social bond is very specific in nature. It is never a social bond between individuals. It's a social bond between every individual and the collective, meaning that the typical solidarity that is so characteristic of mass formation is never a solidarity between individuals. It's a solidarity between the individual and the collective, meaning that every individual is prepared to sacrifice for the collective and also demands of every other individual that it sacrifices for the collective. And that's why in the end, uh, mass formation always leads, leads to a paranoid atmosphere in which uh, everyone snitches everyone else uh, and in which the, the bonds between the people typically um, impoverish more and more. Um, so that state, I could give much more detail, but I won't do it now. That state is uh, identical to hypnosis. Um, mass formation is a kind of hypnosis. It focuses all the attention on one small aspect of reality. And once this happens, the rest of reality seems to disappear or at least has no emotional or cognitive impact anymore. And that's why people are preoccupied and um, overestimate the importance of one aspect of reality. For instance, the victims claimed by the virus, while they almost completely neglect other aspects of reality. For instance, the um, uh, victims claimed by the, by the corona measures, the lockdowns, the, the vaccines, the jabs, uh, and so on. So, uh, and the explanation, explanation, of course, is that this, this, this focusing of attention is an extremely strong mechanism. Again, in, in hypnosis, we see that very well. A simple hypnotic procedure, I've seen that with my own eyes, in which a doctor focuses the attention of a patient 
on one small aspect of reality is sufficient to make the patient completely unaware of the rest of reality, even of his own physical perceptions and of his own physical pain, to the extent that the surgeon can cut through the skin, the flesh can cut even straight through the breastbone to perform an open heart operation without the patient noticing it. That's one example of the power of this mechanism, of the focusing of attention, which also happens in illusionism, for instance, but it's an extremely powerful mechanism. And mass formation uh, is exactly as identical, exactly the same happens in a mass formation. Thank you, uh, Matthias, to, to summarize this. For uh, those who, who want to go more in detail about this, you can watch the uh, uh, tea time interview that's done with uh, Matthias de Smet, and um, the link will be shared in the in the chat. Um, so over to you, Kapacha, um, because uh, from this paper report of June first, which we will also share a link, um, I understood this um, re resonates uh, with you uh, extremely, uh, actually. So uh, you you talked in the in the, the Pele report uh, about the story of mass formation. Matthias is talking about. Uh, you talk about the Wetico, uh, the age of Aquarius, the end of patriarchy, uh, the end of Kali Yuga. Um, can you take us on a ride uh, along these terms and and what's going on from uh, your perspective on this mass formation? Okay, well, <clears throat> we'll see how far out we want to get. <laughs> I don't want to start too far out there, but uh, yes, I will uh, point to uh, so much of what Matthias has uh, spoken about and with the mass formation, the causes of it, okay, you know, has uh, very much to do uh, with uh, the patriarchy is, it is a, uh, you know, we had thousands of years of matriarchy. This is, uh, this is the, the matriarchy was in uh, 6,700 BC was the transition from the matriarchy to the patriarchy. It took a thousand years from 7,500 to 6,500 BC was this transition. And it was a, and it was a movement from the feminine towards the masculine. And we understand that the feminine is this spiritual intuitive, emotional connection that is non-logical, non non-rational. It is, like I said, intuitive, emotional, spiritual. And we moved and we shifted as part of our evolution as a species towards the masculine, towards, the, and they call it the patriarchy, yes, where that we have been in now for, you know, like I say, 7,000, 8,000 years. This is a long period. This goes all the way through the Treta Yuga, through the Dwapara, through Kali Yuga, all the way on through. If we look at the work of Rudolf Steiner in Anthroposophy, this is the fifth post-Atlantean epoch. Yes, he is uh, then going through, this is another descent. So Kali Yuga is this age of darkness that has occurred. Uh, and Steiner speaks of the descent down through the, uh, the post-Atlantean uh, periods of, of, uh, spanning thousands of years. And, and so we also uh, get this understanding in this sense, you know, with, uh, with the patriarchy, with the yugas, with Steiner's work, with occult science, that we are, have been on a descending, separating, isolating, uh, with the purpose of individuating getting in touch with our own unique essence, our own unique gift, as if we are each an individual ray of light from the sun, from the source. So there has been this process of separating out of this feminine ocean of oneness and unity and love. <laughs> and this separating is part of this process that has reached its maximum. So we have, you know, Sir Francis Bacon, right? The, the, the father of, uh, you know, the scientific method and empiricism. And, and it's all coming down to the senses. And it's all about materialism. And what we're experiencing now is the height. I mean, this is the epitome. This is the, <laughs> this is the peak of the materialistic view 
that Matthias is saying is, is like it's rational, logical, left brain, linear, judgment, you know, working with the physical senses. If you can't duplicate the process, if you can't, you know, if you can't write it out and, you know, black and white and just, it's just all of this <laughs> masculine energy that wants to analyze, categorize, figure and calculate and make it all clear. And it's devoid it's devoid of the feminine. It's devoid of emotional connection. And so, and so we have whole societies of people now, as he's speaking, what 60%, you said something, you know, that, you know, had a job that was meaningless, <laughs> you know, and, and feel this sense of disconnection from family, from lovers, from, uh, you know, from their country, from their clan, from, uh, you know, so this, this, uh, this idea of separation is, is, uh, as has reached its peak and we're and, and it creates a crisis so unfortunately humanity evolves and learns through the crisis point so we have you know the darkest hour is just before the dawn we have the winter is just before the spring we have this dying off this deadening and and this brings in uh you know other factors that we can uh, that we can discuss but you know um what, what I really want to bring forward is this, uh, you know, obviously astrology, like I said, it, it works with the timing of these events. And we can use the planetary archetypes. Uh, we can use the uh, symbolism of the signs. Uh, we are also moving out of this age of Aquarius for 2000 years. Yes. And we are uh, birthing now this new age uh, from Pisces to Aquarius. And, and so we are in this transition of the yugas of the fifth Atlantean epoch of the patriarchy. And now we even narrow it farther down into this 2000 year age of going from Pisces into Aquarius. And Aquarius has to do with science, with technology, with artificial intelligence. It has to do with the future. It has to do with collective consciousness. It has to do with the world wide web. And, and this whole, uh, uh, you know, collective consciousness, mass formation, and, uh, and the planet Pluto now goes around every 248 years. Now it's been in the sign, and, and Pluto is in astrology, uh, the force of evolution, the evolutionary force. And when I speak of evolution, I speak of self-knowledge that we evolve through becoming more self-aware and more self-knowledge individually and collectively. So we see this age of Aquarius. Aquarius is the archetype of Prometheus. He stole fire from the gods. He illuminated humanity. He brought in uh, this opening of the third eye, the awakened, uh, you know, this awakened, liberated enlightenment state of consciousness. And Pluto has been in the sign of Capricorn now since 2008. And in 2024, it moves into Aquarius. And it'll stay there until 2024. Now, we can see that 2008 was uh, Capricorn is Earth, physical, material, security. The force of evolution, okay, of Pluto coming through this, uh, you know, which is also governments, institutions that make laws and uh, yeah, Pluto is evolving these governments and we can see these governments evolving. We can see the World Economic Forum. We can see the United Nations. We can see the World Health Organization. We can see a whole shift in the way that the planet is being governed, moving from countries to global, yeah. So what happened in Germany or what happened with the witches? Okay, this is on the next level. And, I, and the only thing that I really think is really important for this is to understand the concept and to keep somewhat of an open mind to reincarnation. That, that we have come back here and back here and back here. And the people that went through Stalin and the people that went through Hitler and the people that went through the Native American Indians getting slaughtered, you know, this whole type of thing, this is that we come in as individual souls 
out of a collective spiritual realm that is timeless and infinite and full of potential. And we come into individualized separate souls over and over and over again. This, these are the same people, whether it's Schwab or Gates or Musk or whatever. These guys have all been around before. <laughs> this is all going on before. This is not, you know, something, uh, you know, that's never been, uh, <laughs> ever been seen. And, and this is what Matthias and what history brings up for us. And, and we can look at this consciously, whether it is through this analytical left brain empirical view or through the, the lens of astrology and reincarnation and intuition. Uh, but we, you know, we're experiencing the same phenomena, right, you know, from different perspectives. I feel that my perspective can bring a, maybe a little bit of a different approach or maybe more um, then, uh, but you know, I, I'm, I don't know uh, Matthias or how far he's gone in his book, like I say. So, um, but uh, are, are you familiar with Rudolf Steiner? Are you familiar with the with the Watiko, uh, Matthias and Paul? Well, I, I, I know his name. I, uh, I, I, I've had a book of him in my hands, but I never read, uh, really read the book. Uh, it's on my list because uh, he's mentioned many times uh, in this crisis. So. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, yes, I, I, I'm, I'm definitely uh, interested in, in, in what he had to say. Uh, well, I can dive, more, if you would dive like. into his work. What he speaks of, and I actually have just a, this little picture of him, though, you know, there is this, uh, uh, we have the polarities, whether it's masculine and feminine or spirit and matter, or, you know, we, we live in a third dimensional realm. We are multidimensional spiritual beings. We know that science has proven 13 dimensions. And so out of these 13 or more dimensions, okay, we come into Okay, planet Earth is, is a third dimensional material, physical experience. And from that, this is a polarized consciousness. We learn and evolve through point consciousness, which has to do with projection. Yes, and, 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 and so when we look at, uh, I'll, get, I'll come back to projection, but what I really want to just uh, you know, work with a little bit here is having to do with Lucifer and Ahriman, because Rudolf Steiner speaks of Lucifer and Ahriman, and these are a polarity. Lucifer can be considered as this warm, hot, juicy, soft, fanti you know, fantasy, imagination that wants to pull us out of this hard, cold, separate earth back into the ocean and the pool of love and oneness and beauty. And it's, a, it's this seductive energy. Yes, you know, that is, you know, that it, well, of course, is demonized. Yes, you know, it is seen as the devil in the Bible, right? You know, so we have this Luciferic force. If you go back to Zarathustra, you go back to Zoroaster, the religions back in the old times, there was Araman. And Araman is this opposite polarity. Araman is cold, hard, science, artificial intelligence, genius, beyond, uh, yeah, yeah, like it makes Einstein, you know, uh, Einstein was just, you know, a, a pupil <laughs> you know, of Araman. You know, he's just completely understanding, deeply connected to this cold, removed, separate, engineered material reality. So Steiner spoke of uh, the incarnation, the physical incarnation of Lucifer was in around 900 BC. And then the Christ consciousness he spoke of, right, in zero. And he said in his life, he died about 100 years ago. He said that in the near future would be the incarnation of Araman. And we and Araman is a is a, a very powerful being, yes, that has minions, minions preparing his incarnation. Steiner even spoke about vaccines. He even said that there would be a vaccine developed that would close off the intuitive soul uh, uh, perception 
of the human being that a vaccine would be developed to actually rob the human being of his intuitive soul connection. So he's gone into a, a number of different facets. I think that these would be very uh, uh, worthwhile a study. But I just want to say that, yes, this is part of, and I, and I want to say that, yes, this is COVID and this is, uh, you know, this is the vaccine, but there's more involved. Yes, the, you know, the, the banks are involved. <laughs> the money is involved. This totalitarian, you know, uh, mass formation extends, okay, out, you know, into, uh, you know, the, the QR codes and, uh, you know, the, the, what we're going to need in order to travel and what we're going to need in order to, uh, you know, be part of, right? You know, uh, you know we have the, the, the whole green movement and the whole, uh, you know, uh, that we'll need to keep track of, you know, our carbon footprint and uh, and it's, this is all coming together with 5g and you know so there's this is this is this is really a massive awakening and it's occurring now uh, particularly as pluto moves through the sign of aquarius like i said from 2024 to 2044 it goes around every 248 years we can go back to 1822 1822 was the last time that Pluto began at the sign of Aries. Aries is the first sign of the zodiac, the first archetype, the emergence of an evolutionary impulse, whether it's individual or collective. This began in 1822, and this and and, and you know it comes around and comes around, and it's a, it's a elliptical orbit. We can't just divide 248 by 12 does not necessarily spend an equal amount of time in each one of the signs. But Aquarius is the 11th sign of the Zodiac. Yeah. Pisces is the 12th. And the 12th is a sacred number, of course, yes, ends the cycle to begin a new cycle. So that whole cycle that began in 1822 is finishing and completing itself in 2068. And that is at the same time that there is another planet just newly discovered, Eris, the goddess of discord, <laughs> just discovered in 2005. And there's even discord about who discovered her when. <laughs> so even going into 2005 to 2007, Eris has a, you know, has a 1500 year cycle. And, and she is in a highly elliptical orbit, uh, tilted 44 degrees from the ecliptic. Well, she is coming up from the, uh, from the belly of the whale, the constellation, the, the whale constellation. And she will actually be reaching the ecliptic at the same time that Pluto crosses over into Aries in the late 2060s, early 2070s. And so I noticed that, you know, uh, when Matthias, uh, the, the YouTube that he gave is like, well, we don't really know uh, the timing, but I just wanted to lay out the timing because what we can see is that, you know, this is an evolutionary process and we can use the phasal relationship. Yes, there's the phasal relationship, just like you have a, a new moon, a crescent moon, a quarter moon, a full moon, a, you know, a disseminating a, a, a balsamic. Uh, you know, we have these phases. Every cycle has phases. So we are in a phase of a larger cycle. And when we look at these phases, it can help us to understand, okay, you know, the inherent evolutionary intentions that are, uh, you know, that are about, that, that this are about. And some of these intentions are, let's just really look at this enlightening, this awakening, this becoming aware of our creative power, of our creative genius as individuals. What quantum physics shows us is that the observer affects the observed. And, and that what we have then is that we, okay, 
we affect, okay, in very many different ways, our reality. This is, uh, this has to do with uh, Carl Jung. This has to do with the collective unconscious. This has to do with the personal unconscious and just with the shadow element of projection. And here we come into Wetiko. Wetiko was by the Cree Indians, gave it the Wetiko name, but it's had many names in all different religions all throughout time as what we could call an evil spirit. But this evil spirit is basically an aspect of this unconsciousness that feeds on fear and is projected to the extent of becoming a reality. So the totalitarian state is a projection of victimization. It is a sense that I am a victim, that I am being oppressed, and it is, and, it, and through that separate self, where there's no one to help me, I am, I am disconnected emotionally, intuitively, psychologically, sexually, uh, you know, social distancing, physically. <laughs> you know, it's just like we were actually, so what we have to do is, you know, this is kind of a wake up of, it's, it's breaking down the wall between the creator and the created between the inner dream and the external reality. The ancient rishis uh, called this maya, that this is maya that we are living in, that we take our inner world, our inner realms, our inner fears, and we project them outside of us. And so when we break down that wall, when we, when we come out of and this is done, of course, through yoga, through meditation, through different forms and understandings of opening the right brain, opening the intuitive, non-rational aspect inside of ourselves, moving into the space. And this is where I say it's love, that the solution and the answer is love. That to me, love is unity consciousness. Love is what, uh, what glues everything together. Love is union. Yes, experienced, whether it is uh, physically, emotionally, psychologically, this love is connection. And as we move into a state of love, as we move from the head, the genius, the cold, rational, aramonic, separate, scientific approach towards understanding ourselves and the world at large, and we shift from that place into the heart, into the realm of spirit. This is what brings us. This is what heals the Wetiko. This is what heals the evil spirit. This is what, you know, awakens and opens humanity to a new dawn, the dawn of a new age, the dawn of a new reality, the dawn of a new potential manifestation of our creative potential. And so this uh, is really experience, you know, and of course, Matthias spoke of, you know, ethical, uh, uh, you know, ethical uh, behavior. And of course, uh, you know, the, the, I, again, it's, I think it's semantics. I think it's words. I think it's language. I think we're talking about the same thing, but I'm going to bring in compassion. Uh, that, that, that when we come into the heart, and we come into a compassionate state of existence where we are vulnerable and we are open to this connection in community, in family, with each other, that we connect with something beyond our, uh, our ego. Our ego consciousness lives in separation. And of course, now I, I could share my screen. I have a couple of different... <laughs> Uh, patterns to show i mean um uh, uh well yeah that's um let's see this is the uh the soul's journey i can maybe come back to that but i just wanted to say ego consciousness is 10 percent of you know 10 percent of the mass of our brain or less is actually conscious <laughs> 90 percent of the mass of our brain is our personal unconscious and then we have this collective unconsciousness that, that, you know, ties us all together. It brings us all together, right? 
And so, you know, this uh, mass formation is this projection of this collective unconscious that each one of us is also individually connected to. So I would say that some folks and one of, uh, you know, uh, something that, you know, Matthias said was that, um, you know, that we need to continue to uh, disturb. We need to continue to talk about. We need to continue to, you know, really bring it up into consciousness. OK, you know, so that people don't, uh, you know, don't forget and 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 uh, and, and we don't lose our footing and, and become, uh, you know, more oppressed, uh, you know, than the, they could say that we already are. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I, I can I can maybe share more later, but I don't want to uh, uh, dominate the uh, entire time here. So uh, to stop sharing. So thank you for. Are you going to share something or? Yeah. A few things. <laughs> Can I first go to Matthias? Is, is that okay with you? All right. Uh, thank you, uh, Kapacha, uh, for uh, this, uh, a lot of information. And if this is new, uh, I can understand it's, it's not very easy. But uh, I think it resonates to uh, the, the, the first and the last part of your book, uh, Matthias. Um, in, in the first part, you, you uh, describe who, who we got into this mechanical worldview and uh, the way we look at science. And in the last part of your book, uh, you suggest how we could get out of this. And in, in, this, um, in the story of the world of today, uh, what Capace is talking about is uh, often dismissed as uh, fluffy and uh, uh, irrational. Um, so uh, I wondered how, how uh, does his story resonate to you and how can you reply to it with these two parts uh, of your book? Yes, yeah, so, uh, I have the feeling that um, the, there is a common ground in this respect, that uh, it's all about the relationship of the human being with rational understanding. Well, that's one thing, one thing that I that resonates like since the beginning of the tradition of enlightenment. And of course, I take a different perspective. I analyze the tradition of enlightenment and the ideology of reason, as it is sometimes called, from within. And as to a, to a certain extent, I stand with, within the field, the tradition of enlightenment, and I analyze the problems there. And then from within, I try to find an opening uh, to get out of that uh, ideology, this view on man and the world. Um, while Kaipacha, I think you uh, take a perspective that is more situated outside of the, of the tradition of enlightenment. So um, that's a difference, but I think essentially what I hear is that, well, what we share, I think, is that also in my analysis, um, well, somewhere in the beginning of the 16th century, when modern science started to uh, emerge in, in our society and then modern science step by step uh, became successful and uh, got a grip of uh, and and and, and uh, became dominant um, in uh, in Western culture first and then actually around the world. We could see that while at that moment we started to consider the entire universe as a machine, uh, a set of elementary particles that interact with each other according to the laws of mechanics, and not only as a machine but as a dead machine, everything in this universe was considered to be dead. There was, there is no life in a mechanistic universe. Uh, and that's, yes, that's exactly why, of course, well, and at the same time, and that's essential for me, at that moment, the human being started to be in the grip of the illusion that through rational understanding, 
it could completely reduce the mystery of the universe and of life, and that uh, to rational understanding, it could understand everything in the universe, it could predict everything in the universe, it could control everything in the universe, it could manipulate everything in the universe, it could itself recreate, literally recreate everything in the universe, it could make artificial plants, trees, and that in the end, you see how this idea emerges very soon in the tradition of enlightenment, at the same time, while the human being declared uh, that there was no such thing as a god in society, uh, it sneaked itself to the throne of God and it put itself on the throne and it started to believe <laughs> that the human being could become godlike and that it would be able to uh, live eternally, that it would be able to eliminate death, suffering, dying. Uh, that it would be able to um, create a constant happiness for itself through biochemical manipulation of the blood. If you read, for instance, the contemporary, we have um, in the 19th century, we have a few thinkers who expressed that very clearly, that idea that uh, the human being should become God. Uh, and now we see the same idea in, in such people as uh, Yuval Harari in his book, uh, Homo Deus, for instance. Uh, so that I think, uh, in the end, um, well, that mechanistic thinking, uh, it's promises that it will bring uh, everything to the human being, that it will fulfill, fulfill all his dreams and all its desires. Uh, but in a, in a hidden way, it immediately starts to impoverish the core of human existence in this respect that it immediately isolates the human being from its, uh, its natural environment, from its social environment, from its human environment. And I, I, I have experienced that in a very tangible and concrete way in my own life. I have the stubborn a drive to understand rationally. And um, um, it took me until I was 35 years old before I suddenly, or maybe I should say before it was revealed to me that the essence of life and the essence of the real around us, of reality, of, of the real, I prefer the word real, the essence of uh, the other human beings around us, uh, transcends rationality, escapes rationality. And paradoxically, for me, uh, I discovered this in a strictly rational way. I, I, I started to study somewhere when I was around 35, I started to study complex dynamical systems theory and chaos theory. And these theories actually show in a, and that's paradoxical, in a strictly rational way, that the essence of every complex dynamical system, which is uh, uh, most phenomena in nature, is, be, is strictly irrational, literally, that it behaves as an irrational number. And um, suddenly, and I know many people, or not so many people, but uh, people who are familiar with these theories, and in a, same, in a strange way, they do not experience this revelation. <laughs> but for me, I suddenly noticed that the world around me um, is irrational and can never be grasped by logical language, for instance, international language. And that suddenly made me realize what Niels Bohr, the famous physicist, really meant when he said, when it comes to atoms, Language can only be used as poetry. I suddenly started to understand that. That was literal, literally, that logical language. And that's a strange thing. At that moment, so, a few things happened in me, in myself. And I first started to realize what happened in myself when I was four or five years old. At the moment, I, at that moment, I started to open up and to... resonate in a more direct way with my environment and, and my, my relationship with death and dying 
um, also changed. And later on, I started to understand what happens when you believe that everything around you can be understood in a rational way, in a logical way. You quite literally build a wall around you. A wall, because what is logical reasoning? Logic, in logical reasoning, you connect the one logical idea to the other without space in between. That's exactly what logics is. In logical, in a, in a line of logical re reasoning, the one ID inevitably leads to the other ID, and the other ID leads inevitably to the other ID. In this way, that there is a strict, fixed path between the, the first ID and the last one. That's what a set of mathematical equations is. That's what that's what a set of um, that's what geometrics is. And in that way, logical thinking shows the most straightforward characteristic with a machine. Because in a machine, that's exactly what makes a machine so attractive. If you push one button, the end result will be inevitably one thing. So it gives you, it gives the human being a sense of control and of predictability, a sense of mental control a sense of material control. That's what makes the machine metaphor so attractive. Why do we continue to believe that the universe is a machine? Just because I think it satisfies one of them, or it takes one of the most fundamental anxieties of the human being away. The anxiety for uncertainty. The human being is an uncertain human being. We, we, all, we always think that the human being distinguishes itself from, an, from animals because it knows more, but it's quite the opposite that is true. The human being distinguishes itself from an animal because it constantly is confronted with things it doesn't know. You will never see a human being sitting on a bank somewhere, pondering over what the meaning of its life is, whether the other animals love uh, or, 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 or like uh, or like it, or whether what the, what the meaning of its life is. A human being is not confronted with this lack of knowledge. A human, a human being, uh, 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 an animal is not, is not constantly confronted with a lack of knowledge. Uh, and, and a human being is constantly. Our mental experience constantly gravitates around a lack of knowledge. And uh, the, the, the idea that the entire universe would be a machine that is strictly predictable and strictly rationally understandable, strictly that can be manipulated and controlled, that, that frees uh, the human being of, 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 its, of its most uh, typical uh, disease, namely this uncertainty. And, and so in one way or another, um, I think that's why human beings often so stubbornly try to rationally understand and not knowing what, no, not knowing that while they connect the one logical idea to, to the other, while they try to reduce everything, the, uh, the real, to, to the categories of its own logical understanding, they isolate themselves from the environment. They, they um, uh, estrange themselves from the mystery of life, and they become incapable of hearing the eternal music of life around them. And as soon as you start to be capable of bearing the fact that, you're, that there will always be uncertainty, that your logical understanding will always be limited, that it will never be able to, ask, to grasp the essence of life. As soon as you start to be capable of doing that, at the moment you start to experience the lack of certainty as the necessary precondition for your existence as a human being, because that's true. It's exactly because nobody can explain everything in a logical way, because nobody uh, can be absolutely sure about what you have to do in life, about how uh, you should um, interpret uh, the big questions of life uh, and so on. It's exactly because nobody can be sure that every, every human being has the... Um, intrinsic right to give its own answers and to give its 
to live its own life in its own creative, singular, uh, unique way. And that's the moment when you make choices uh, in resonance with the music of life, but really your own choices, which cannot be reduced to uh, uh, someone else telling you what you have to do, in which the impact of the other is, um, is a, a small or non-existent. It is at that moment that you start to exist, really, as a human being, that you start to exist as a human subject, not as an ego. An ego is something different. When you exist as an ego, you identify with the visual image and you isolate yourself from the environment. Inevitably, you need an ego, I think, to a certain extent. You have to be able to put it aside at certain moments, but uh, you have to be very careful with the ego. So, but anyway, it was at the moment I started to be capable of uh, accepting that logical understanding is only the first step uh, of the process of knowledge uh, and that it will never be able to grasp the essence of, of, uh, of the mystery of life. Uh, it is at that moment, I think, quite literally, the, the, the logical building blocks of the wall around you start to slide away a little bit from each other. And there are little, there appear little goals in the wall. And through these holes, I think quite literally, the vibration of life, the eternal music of life enters your being and touches the strings of your being. And it is at that moment that you can start to resonate with the real, with the essence of life, with the eternal spirit of life. And it is there, that's, I think, again, somewhat paradoxically, the logical explanation why it is the limit of logics that makes you capable of resonating with life and at the same time which makes you uh, capable of tolerating the idea that there is something like death and dying just because as soon as you participate in the eternal uh, vibration of life around you you feel that um, the end of your physical existence uh, is not the end of, uh, of your existence uh, uh, as, a real, as a real being. And um, so in that way, I believe that, I believe that we have to go through the process of rationality. Uh, what happened the last few hundred years is not meaningless. It's not without purpose. We have to climb, um, yeah, the stairs of rationality, step by step. But we only should, we should, if we do it in a sincere way, we will soon reach a point where we know for sure that there is a land before us that we cannot enter through rationality. Rational understanding is the first part of the process of uh, gathering knowledge, the real knowing. And I like the difference between, you know, René Tom, one of the most famous mathematicians of the 20th century and one of the founders of systems theory, uh, gave us the following marvelous quote. He said, this part of reality that can be understood in a rational way is very limited. And the rest of reality, we can only know through empathically resonating with it. And the first time, he used the word, the first knowledge, the rational knowledge, is indicated in French by the word savoir, which refers to voir, to see with the eye. There is a kind of knowledge that you can see with the eye and through which you can come to logical understanding of the world around you. But the second word is in French, connaître. It means connaître, literally meaning uh, to be born together. And so that's a, a different kind of knowledge. It's a resonating kind of knowledge, which reveals something and which makes and which gives you the feeling that every time this knowledge is revealed to you, you are born again as a human being. And the French, the French words are, are wonderful. And um, I believe that, for instance, the samurai, the samurai culture in Japan was very well aware of these two different types of knowledge. They said that, when you learn the martial arts or no matter what the craft or art, there is always first this rational stage in which you 
practice certain techniques, for instance, the techniques of the martial arts. These techniques explain you in a rational way how you can uh, behave in a certain situation, what you have to do under certain situations, conditions, what you can do to craft a certain object, and so on. This is a technical stage. And if you practice these techniques for a long time, uh, slowly you will start to develop a different kind of knowledge, a more a certain feeling with what you do, a certain knowledge that transcends technical knowledge and rational knowledge. And it's that knowledge that is the real knowledge and it's that knowledge that should be the final destination of the process of learning. And the samurai said something very beautiful. They had this proverb saying, first you have to protect the rules of an art and then you have to break them and leave them behind. And they said, it's quite difficult to learn the techniques of the martial arts, but it's even more difficult to forget them again. And if you don't succeed in forgetting them again, before you go to the battlefield, you will die on the battlefield. And so there is, again, this connection between rationality and death. <laughs> There's something in rationality that is intrinsically connected to death. That doesn't take away from me that we need rationality and we need to transcend rationality. We need, to, we need rationality step by step uh, to finally transcend it. And I, I know that, well, that's also the entire uh, meaning of the, the ancient mystical traditions. Uh, I've not invested too much time in that, but enough to understand that, um, that um, um, they, they were all about that, about uh, the relationship of the human being to on one hand, rational knowledge, and on the other hand, to something that transcends rational knowledge. And it is at this point where rational knowledge is transcended that the human being can, uh, can uh, create an encounter with what is indicated by the word God, um, usually. Max, Max Planck, the physicist, the famous physicist, uh, testified of this, uh, wrote about this in a very beautiful way. Um, it's, it's, it's wonderful what he said about his own um, process, his own way, how he uh, went through a process of rational understanding and he, how he arrived, he said, as a scientist, at the same point where religion once started. Uh, Max Planck said that, in my opinion, science finally arri arrives where religion once started in a personal contact with uh, something that escapes all rational and, and uh, logical understanding. And uh, every human being has to go through this process, I think. Every human being has to go through it in his own way, in its own way. Um, we all should, uh, otherwise we create a master and a slave. If there is only one who goes through the process and the other doesn't, the, the, the one who doesn't will always have to live under the authority of the one who did. And in the end, um, they will both fail uh, to, uh, to stay in contact with, uh, with, uh, the, with that what transcends uh, rationality. So, um, well, um, that's uh, a little bit my own, the own, my own way in which at this moment now, I, um, I, uh, think about rationality. Um, at the same time, it's something uh, which is wonderful, which is characteristic for the human being, uh, but only under the condition that we uh, are prepared to accept that rational understanding can never be uh, the destination of a human life. Uh, that we, that the the promised land uh, transcends rational understanding and that if we stick to rational understanding, if we are not prepared to accept the limitations, that it uh, will kill us and that it will destroy us as a human being because humanity, humaneness, is in the strict sense of the word impossible if we try to reduce everything to, uh, to rational understanding. Thank you, uh, Matthias. For also for the personal part in your story. 
uh, uh, looking at the time, I first want to ask Elke if there are any questions. Um, yes, there are two questions. Um, a short one, which is, what is the correct name of the French mathematician Matthias just mentioned? René Tom. Or E N E T H O M. Okay. And then there is a question for Kaipacha. Um, I think this is a, a, a little bit longer answer. What influence does the moon snowdal axis have on the current paradigm? Will anything significant happen in July 2023 when it shifts from Scorpio Taurus? Yeah, I mean, that is pretty far off topic right now. <laughs> and that might be someone that uh, uh, listens to me regularly. Um, I don't know. Question for Maria Etherly. Uh -huh. yeah. uh, maybe, uh, uh, maybe another question then, Kapacha. You, you told in the Pele report that there, that there will be an uh, intensification in August. What do you mean by that? Yes. Um, well, in uh, in August there is a, uh, a conjunction in the first week of uh, the North Node of the Moon, Uranus and Mars, and uh, it, when we combine these uh, these these three energies, these three archetypes uh, symbolize that masculine fire dynamic warrior energy of Mars combined with. The uh, Prometheus, uh, the intelligent, scientific, but also erratic, unpredictable and extreme that uh, changes and shifts of what the North Node of the Moon has to do with the, uh, the, the emotional, the moon, the moon body. And this is the future evolutionary path is the North Node of the Moon. So the three of these coming together, which does not occur often. Right, um, uh, you know, it signifies sudden uh, rapid breakthroughs. So there will be a breakthrough. There will be an awakening. There could be a shock, uh, but it, it, it is a, a revelation of truth that will be seen, and and so this uh, this will probably uncover. You know, this, I mean, this can even be having something to do with the CERN. Yes, there can be uh, scientific uh, breakthroughs, but then there can also be political and social upheaval. Uh, and, and because Uranus is the planet of revolution and, and wanting to rebel against, okay, the this, this status quo and the consensus, there would be something that I could bring forward, but I, I, uh, uh, it's, a, it's, it's a rather uh, lengthy uh, explanation mm -hmm. of the... Uh, uh, the archetypes and the evolutionary stages that uh, I think Matthias was really referring to and, and, and sharing in his own way uh, that, uh, that would uh, complement. But um, I know it's nearing, uh, uh, nearing our time. I don't know if you can stay longer with us, Matthias. Or, um... Well, I have, an, I have a new appointment at uh, half past five my time. I will have to leave you. But I, uh, I liked it very much, Kaipacha, and uh, thank you for... Uh, Moderating this, Misha, um, I liked it very much. Uh, I always like to talk to people who uh, take a different perspective, but uh, with whom there is enough resonance to uh, to be able to to share, really share ideas, and to open up uh, each other's minds in this way. So, uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, yes, very thank you for your time, uh, Matthias. <laughs> thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Okay, I hope to see you again or talk to you again sometime. Likewise, we will see each other again. Okay. Bye-bye. Uh, okay, can I ask um, another question? Um, uh, yeah, sure. I have also another question uh, for Kapacha to yeah, so we can you, round up. But do that question first. What is the timing you refer to, Kapacha, for the resulting effects of the current mass formation? Yes, well, I mean, we. <laughs> this is a this is a little tricky. I think I want to share my screen. I want to go in with the uh, uh, an explanation that, and I'll come back to that through this explanation because, in some ways, I feel that there's a little bit of a of a uh, a separation. 
I don't think I don't want to call it a judgment day, <laughs> but there's a there, there's a certain uh, group of uh, folks that are going to move one direction, and there's another group of folks that's going to move a, a different direction. Yeah, and so there will be this uh, 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 somewhat a division uh, that uh, hopefully will be a uh, you know a reunification farther down the road, but. Um, uh, we just want to kind of understand that we're uh, we're at a, a tipping point right now, and um, yeah, uh, if you have time, I'm uh, certainly uh, willing to go through some more explanation here. We we plan this time until six o'clock, uh, so uh, let's do it. So um, I'll uh, just uh, share my screen with you and go back to you know actually what i had uh, up here before and um because this can this is both okay this is both for an individual that is re reincarnating through lifetime after lifetime after lifetime this is what i call the the school of planet earth this is the soul's journey through the earth plane that requires multiple lifetimes and what should be actually in bold is depending upon the free will choices made in those lifetimes. There are different people making different choices as we, as we, you know, as we are sharing today, there are people making choices and these free will choices. This is what is so phenomenal about planet earth, about the third dimension, <laughs> about separation, about the logic, rational intelligence that Matthias is speaking of, is that we are allowed to deviate. We are allowed to devolve. We are allowed to slow down, speed up, take le go left, go right, <laughs> go with the flow, go against the flow, evolve, resist evolution. The, 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 we have these opportunities, and there, and and we find ourselves. We know ourselves, we reveal ourselves to ourselves through the consequences of our choices. And so this happens also collectively. So what we can say is, you can see these little arrows down here at the bottom. When we come into this, this third dimensional earth experience, three quarters of any given population on planet Earth are in what we call the consensus stage of evolution, stage one. It starts out as workers. After hundreds of lifetimes, they become managers. After hundreds of lifetimes, they become owners. And let's go up to the very tippy, tippy, tippy top over here, because these are, right, your CEOs of corporations, and these are your Davos billionaires, and these are your Hollywood movie stars, and these are the owners of the New York Times, and these are the United Nations folks. These are the owners of the pharmaceutical companies. This is, these, this is all looking very much at Saturn, physical, conscious, material world the empirical world that Matthias was speaking about, that is, lives in separation. It does not have to do with spiritual powers as much as random forces. And there's an illusion that these can be figured out or understood and create a sense of meaning, fulfillment, purpose, and ultimate harmony. Or transcendence but it doesn't <laughs> because it's only stage one <laughs> so so what we get into this situation here is at some point after some lifetime and we could say maybe even collectively we could be hitting the end of stage one collectively you see over thousands and thousands of years we are now breaking through into the individuated state uranus Yes. And, and what he speaks of, uh, you know, that uh, Matthias was speaking of, how important it is, how our thinking 
Okay, and how science and how everything that we have come, you know, to understand this is breaking away like he has broken away. We could say that, you know, Matthias himself is in the individuated stage of of evolution. It starts out with the rebel. This is 20 percent. This is one in five people break out of. Yeah, they're not going to follow external authority. They're going to follow and trust their own internal experience. Become the author of their own life. You heard Matthias speak, you know, that he had, you know, not a voice inside him, but something told him <laughs> that, you know, the way that they were, you know, doing their studies and doing their research was not accurate. It was not right. And he went to his colleagues. His colleagues are in the consensus, right? And, and, he, and he deviated, he broke out, he individuated away from his colleagues because his colleagues are the owners of the institutions and they're the professors at the universities that are keeping people and educating people you know, from this Saturnian physical worldview. And, we, and, and, and like you said, this leads to death. So there comes a point, there comes a lifetime, there comes a period of history that may be on the horizon where we see that there is more involved in life than random forces, that there is love, there is spirit, there is irrational, illogical, emotional powers at play that give us our humanity that give us meaning and purpose and connection. So this breaking free, this breaking out leads to first a rebellion. And we can say the first stage of this is anger. I've been lied to, I've been deceived. I've been told that this little pill is going to save me or this little vaccine is going to save me or this religion is going to save me or this uh, government is going to save me, blah, blah, blah. That some external authority is going to solve my problems. <laughs> right. So this is a big wake up and there's this, this anger. But then the rebel, the rebel becomes the artist, the entrepreneur. We could say entrepreneur is the creator. You get in touch with your individual creativity. And through our individual creativity, we get in touch with our unique genius. Here's Max Planck. He just, Matthias spoke of Max Planck. He spoke of Bohr, right? We speak of Einstein, Da Vinci. We speak of these geniuses that have brought uh, the, the mind as far as the mind can go. Understanding, yes, the whole reasoning, the whole, this is the intellectual genius. Symbolized by the planet Uranus in astrology, the ruler of Aquarius, the age of Aquarius that we are now entering, that Pluto in 2023, next year, Pluto enters the age of Aquarius. Pluto is the force of evolution. We will, you will be in this age of Aquarius working with these Uranian forces, these very powerful, intellectual, scientific artificial intelligence, whatever worldwide. This is all going to intensify from 2023, 2024. Pluto will, will evolve through the stage of Aquarius for the next 20 years until 2044. Uh, sorry to interrupt you, uh, Kapacha. You, uh, in a, an interview that we did before um, for Restory, you told this time right now is like a, an, a hair dryer in a bath tube. Um, yes, I liken Uranus to the hair dryer in the bathtub. In astrology, Uranus rules the nervous system. Yes, it has to do with the nervous system. And it also has to do with sudden traumatic shocking events. 
that awaken us, aha moments that can be aha. I should have known that all along. How wonderful. Now I see things that I never saw before that that bring it all together and help me make sense of my life and myself and my history. And the, there are good aha moments. And then there are other aha moments that break the illusion, the Watiko. You have been lied to. You have been deceiving yourself. You have been deluding yourself. You've been telling yourself, oh, you know, a falsehoods in order to belong to your family or in order to, you know, follow what the government says or in order to belong to, you know, uh, this religion or this guru or this, you know, community. Yeah, we, we tell ourselves things to maintain relationships, to give ourselves a sense of meaning. But sometimes these are false inaccurate sense of meaning and we have a, a false identity and a false sense of purpose and this is the process of disillusionment and this disillusionment even leads us out of our mind and this is where we move after many 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 lifetimes we go out of our mind Neptune is the planet symbolizing the collective unconscious. It is the planet symbolizing spirituality, but it is also the planet connected with disillusionment, with chaos, with the paradox, which is coexisting opposites that should destroy each other or should not be able to coexist. It, it, it's a paradox. It doesn't make sense. It is totally outside the egoic, logical, rational, intellectual mind. It is spiritual. And this is what Harari and uh, the Great Reset and uh, all the artificial intelligence and Neuralink and Elon Musk and Bill Gates and, and all these materialistic thinking massive egos that are maybe at the top here in their genius or at the top of this pyramid living in absolute separation the, this is the this is the peak of narcissism this is the peak of sociopathic behavior this is the peak of psychotic forms of behavior where I can do no wrong. I am God. I know all. I, I did this small group of people, these Davos billionaires or these, you know, totalitarians that think that they can, you know, govern the whole world. It's, it's, it's a farce. <laughs> it's mm. hilarious. It's not funny, but it is, a, it's a huge illusion. It's doomed to failure because it is not natural. It is not natural law. It does not reflect the reality. These people are deluded into thinking that they, that, that the human being, yeah, that the human, I don't want to say human being, I want to say human ego, that their human ego is so big as to uh, you know, uh, think that they know better than nature, that they're going to modify our DNA that was, you know, that we, that nature, that God, that spirit, you know, has brought through and through natural selection has been refining over, you know, hundreds of thousands of years. And these guys think that they're going to improve the tomato. And they're going to improve. They're going to make laboratory meat that's going to be better than cow or lamb or or pork. Or that they're going to, you know, I, I mean, the, it, it is hysterical. It's ridiculous. It's absurd. <laughs> what if, if I can interrupt uh, once more, uh, Kapacha? Feed us. Which, yes. <laughs> when when you, when you are telling this, uh, a standard reaction is that this is. Uh, conspiracy thinking 
And uh, Matthias <laughs> also uh, has an interesting chapter about uh, conspiracy and ideology. So, um, what would be uh, your reaction to uh, this being called uh, conspiracy? Uh, his thought of what Matthias uh, tells in his book is that um, conspiracy is the easy way to avoid uh, ideas that inter interrupt the mass formation. Well, let's look at it. As you can see, this is 5% of any given population. <laughs> okay, so this is one out of 20 people. Right here, we have three quarters of the people. And these three quarters of the people who vote, okay, these are the people that are in the consensus. They read the newspapers. They watch the mainstream media. They look up to the leaders of the day. They don't look outside. They don't look at history. They don't look in the future. They don't look in the past. They're just looking at their screens and their iPhones right now, and they're paying attention to what you know the mainstream media tells them. And they're only looking in the physical and they're only using their conscious egos. So what is the definition of a theory? A theory is something that cannot be proven with this logical, empirical, uh, statistical studies. Yeah. And so, um, I, of course, uh, you know, anyone that goes outside OK, of this is going to be seen, OK, you know, as a conspiracy theorist Yes, and a conspiracy. This is, a, you know, I mean, I don't have a dictionary here, but a conspiracy is a conspiracy is you know, something a group of people are conspiring. This is more than one person. Right. So it's, 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 you know, some some group is conspiring. They're they're coming together. OK. In order to, you know, do something that is covert. That is hidden. Or secret or behind the scenes. So what we can you know, what we can understand from that is, you know, um, you know, if it, that basically this is just like society wanting to put a label. Yes. You know, there's a there's a particular label that they're going to just. And I think Matthias even speaks about this as a, a scapegoat, because these people are looking for a scapegoat. They're looking for those who disagree with the uh, narrative, the current narrative, and they are going to then uh, eradicate. Uh, and, and and the more that they can eradicate what this is, 25 percent of the population. This is the this is 20 percent of the individuated. The only thing is that these are the most intelligent people. Yes, because this is this is very intelligent. And as you move beyond this intelligence into the spiritual, then you even become aware the disciple, the guru, the avatar. You become aware of subtle psychic energies. You do remote viewing. You see them coming to your door before they come to your door. <laughs> you know, your intuitive capacity, you know, multiplies. And it do really doesn't make any difference, okay, whether they uh, label you as a conspiracy theorist, as uh, some kind of a, but uh, they will probably see you as a threat. But I will, I will go on to say that, you know, this is creative. And this is outside the mainstream. And this is the saving grace, because ultimately these people are going to be let down and they are going to be illusioned. And we're going to see, you know, not only the death rate increase, but the suicide rate increase, the amount of despair and the amount of, uh, you know, uh, uh, people is now at like 70, 80 percent of the population is taking pharmaceutical drugs. And, you know, the DSM-5 is basically saying that everyone can, everyone on planet Earth falls into one of the categories of mental uh, ill health. And there is a drug for you. So anytime you, people are going and buying into this system, yes, you know, um, uh, of not being, I would say it's quite dangerous to not be a conspiracy theorist at this point. <laughs> These are the people that are going to have the, the hardest time, the rudest awakening, 
uh, the most amount of difficulty and sorrow as they uh, as they become more separated, more desperate, yes, are more controlled, slip into victim consciousness, guilt, shame, ill health, leading up to, as Matthias spoke of, death. So we're going to see a uh, very big, many changes going on. What I want to share here is really um, the timing of this events. The timing of these events, basically, is you can see that this began, what, December of 2020 was really when we had this Jupiter, Saturn, Pluto conjunction come together for the first time since 1894 B.C., 4,000 years ago, Jupiter, Saturn, and Pluto came together in the sign of Capricorn. So this great reset is definitely is a great reset. It's just we have to redefine exactly as, uh, you know, when I refer to a great reset, I'm not referring to Klaus Schwab's book. <laughs> uh, there is a much greater, greater, greater reset than he could possibly himself imagine. But let's look at the timing of these things. Oh, I see. Uh, I did not. Uh, I want to go into a. Uh... So uh, as we move years ahead now, here is 2021, December of 2021. And then we have December of 2022. And I can go into a lot of the astrology here. I don't want to keep you all day. I just want to really move on to a couple of different things. And that is, number one, this big shift that happens. Here's 12 to 1. Yes, this is the close. Saturn is a 28-year cycle. Neptune is a 165-year cycle. It's a Saturn-Neptune cycle, when we put the two of these together, spans hundreds of years and particularly when they come together at one degree of aries yeah i'll take it off of years come back to months and we can see here in 2026 yes we have okay so what i'm saying is Pluto moves into Aquarius in 2024. Saturn and Neptune move into Aries in 2026. And watch Uranus now. We really want to get Uranus out of Taurus. <laughs> and what do we see here? Sextile, sextile, trine. 2026. Okay. This is air sign, air sign, fire. Fire and air need each other, feed each other. It's going to get, things are really going to get moving. Yes, things are going to really, so we're going through this period now, like I say, um, it's, it's closing, ending, finishing, completing. Saturn, okay, moving through Pisces, okay, for three years from 2023 to 2026. We've got Saturn, and this is sorrow, sadness, despair. Pisces rules hospitals and institutions. Okay, Neptune rules disillusionment and suicide. This is a, we have some very, 23, 24, 25, I have to say, is not going to be an easy walk in the park. We're yeah, really yeah. going to be, you know, this is Watiko. Neptune and Pisces, this is with Tico at its maximum. And so what I'm saying now is that it's going to get worse before it gets better, but it is going to get better. And then, even then, we still have Pluto moving through Aquarius. And personally, I believe that we really need to go until Pluto crosses into Aries. I really feel that Pluto is going to be moving, like I said, from 2024 uh, to 2044, revolutionizing technology, science, vaccines, and everything else, politics, the world government. The, uh, it's not just going to be world health. It's going to be world government. 
Yes, and it's going to include China and Russia. And I mean, this is a globalization that's going on here over the next 20 years. But then Pluto moving through Pisces is ending, finishing, closing, completing, like I say, what began back in the early 1800s. Okay, the beginnings, right, you know, of, uh, you know, of not the industrial revolution, but, you know, the, just the whole, there's a whole period in early uh, Europe, yeah, you know, that was going on in these 18, in the 1800s. But anyway, so this Pluto to me is what's really, uh, you know, Pluto is the planet of death, transformation, and rebirth, and resurrection. And we are, uh, you know, a, as this force of evolution moves through Aquarius, it's going to be with science and technology. Then with Pisces, it's going to revolutionize and evolve the collective unconscious. Pisces is the collective unconscious. Pisces is spirit. Pisces is love. Pisces is unity consciousness. And Pluto moving through Pisces will be an entire soul group incarnating from 2044 to 2068 that are, you know, that are coming in, you know, with, to me, a tremendous uh, new understanding of the quantum field of reality of how we are structured as we are we're basically changing the uh, the identity or the the meaning of what it is to be human yeah and i think matthias was referring to that that we can sit at the side of the river <laughs> we can sit at the side of the river not like a skunk or not like a squirrel or not like a lion or an elephant we sit at the and we will we will be altering and changing and i'm not talking about a cyborg i am not talking about robots i am talking about what they are trying to do now with machines and matter and technology we are going to be able to do without the machines and the technology. Yes. So this is a, so, this is a powerful time of awakening. So Capacha, if it's without technology, how uh, do we meet in 2068 and talk about this? How, how we went through this period we're not going to need Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I, I we will like be to... able. Uh, we, we will be able to connect. And I think even Matthias said, you know, like he knew or he saw, yes. he felt, and he trusted his feeling. And I and I, I hope that he, uh, you know, uh, trusts that. Uh, and it's like a the still small voice within. The more that we listen to this voice within the more it grows and the more our capacity to work with invisible inaudible intangible forces builds and we will be able to see know feel and connect with each other uh, in uh you know on the there's the etheric plane the astral plane the physical plane, the mental plane. I mean, we have many planes and frequencies of existence. And what we're really doing is we are expanding our spectrum. Think of the rainbow getting more colors. <laughs> Think of, uh, you know, the station getting more, you know, the, the radio getting more stations. We're just expanding our capacity, you know, to operate on other frequencies than we are currently able to do. So um, if if um, if you look at this, you might think, um, what can I do in my personal life? How, how can I have an influence on this? We we call this the illusion of powerlessness. That you, as a person, think that you cannot do anything or add or make a difference because 
you are just tiny one person in this whole system of, uh, well, astrological, as you said, but also what Matthias was, was telling about. Um, how, how do you um, uh, give uh, people this positive energy to, to make them powerful? and to have an impact and to make yeah this is where this is where we run into the limits of the logical rational thinking mind uh, that uh, that is only uh, seeing a person as a physical body as a uh, small separate uh, little piece of a bigger puzzle <laughs> i mean it's you know it's ridiculous we have uh, our etheric bodies, we have magnetic fields, we have astral bodies. Don't tell me I am powerless. <laughs> it's ridiculous. We are super powerful. And part of what we need and part of this, what this Watiko is teaching us and part of what this whole totalitarian trip is about is teaching people that they need to get in touch with their creative power, with their creative genius. And so we are, this, you know, we are going to come out of this empowered. So this is not an avoidance. This is not a stepping away. This is not using some conspiracy theory to not deal with you know, what's going on. Absolutely not. This is empowering people to make choices. And just like I showed with the pyramid, there are different people are going to be in different evolutionary stages and they're going to be working on different realms so people will be working on physical realms. There will be healers. Okay, this is a shungite. Okay, you know it. Uh, you know it helps uh, with the EMFs. Okay, and protecting us. You know, you know, protecting me from. Okay, the electromagnetic fields. You know, made by this computer. I'm talking in. <laughs> you know, this whole kind of. You know, so there'll be physical uh, revolutions and breakthroughs that will help people with their physical bodies. Healers. Uh, the, 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 you know, if, if you want to make a good living, just, you know, uh, you know, get into the healing arts because we have a sick population and it's going to get sicker, right? The more that they take these jabs because these, uh, these vaccines are destroying the immune systems. Yeah. And so, you know, uh, the population is going to really um, become uh, you know, less and less healthy over time, as it is already, we see people getting more cancers and uh, you know having more uh, uh, health problems than ever before since they uh, since they started these inoculations. Yeah. Then they'll be working on the mental realm. There'll be those you know working with you know new breakthroughs, scientific, uh, technological, okay, communicative. Uh, you know, working you know, you know, with you know with uh, different forms of energy, uh, different ways of uh, creating community, stepping outside, uh, you know permaculture communities, nonviolent communication, finding different ways you know to gather people together to overcome the sense of isolation and separatism, and then there'll be people working on the astral planes, and it will look from the outside as if they're doing nothing. And, and people could point fingers at them and say, oh, look, it, they're avoiding, they're being passive, they're, uh, you know, they're uh, stepping out, uh, you know, blah, 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 blah. And they, they can be working on other invisible levels and frequencies having extremely powerful effects upon the collective consciousness. Yes, and I don't mean like just, you know, spells and voodoo and, <laughs> you know, but magic. I'm, I'm speaking I, I, of magic. I'm speaking of that there are, uh, you know, there are spiritual forces that can be, okay, worked with, manipulated and used to, okay, you know, work magic. So we have magicians amongst us. So, you know, there's different, you know, it's like in, in, there's not one recipe for, you know, it's, it's not like I'm going to sit here and, and tell people what they need to do. Every individual needs to tap into their own soul through meditation, through silencing and stilling the mind, through pranayamic breath work. We need to be opening up these channels of consciousness within ourselves and listen 
to our own personal guidance to see where we are needed because we incarnated at this time on purpose. Everyone here has incarnated. It's almost like the train has been coming from the country to the city. And, and souls have been getting on the train, getting on the train. The population of Earth has been rising, has been rising, has been rising. And the train's coming towards London. <laughs> and there's standing room only. You know, the population of the Earth is at its maximum right now. You know, it's just like we've got to get on Earth right now. We want to go through this in a physical body. So it's like everybody's here for this. This is this is, we're going to look back over these years as it's just like, you know, the grand finale, the, uh, the fireworks uh, show of an old paradigm that, uh, that, you know, we will not be able to believe how, uh, you know, hypnotized, how asleep humanity actually was prior to this great awakening of, Watiko, COVID, Great Reset, whatever you want to call it. These are very, very powerful years, and um, it, uh, it can be uh, a very, uh, very exciting from uh, a, uh, a soul spirit perspective. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Elka, are there any questions for Kapacha? No further questions. <laughs> no further questions. There you are. <laughs> Thank you very much. Time, so. Sorry? We're getting over time, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we, we are finishing. Namaste. Aloha. Aloha. So much. So much love. <laughs> Thank you so much, Kapacha. Okay. Bye-bye for now. Thank you.